Rishi Maharaj. My brother, thank you so much for joining me this morning. How thank are you? I am fine. And good morning to your listeners also. It is always good to have you here this morning. By the way, guys, we're waking up to a, waking up to a number of things, and we are not oblivious. We are not doing the ostrich thing. We will be looking at the Marlene uh, McDonald situation a little later <laughs> on this morning. But Rishi is here this morning, as I said, in the area of procurement. Procurement legislation is something we've been talking about for a long time. To quote Rishi, he said, the potential of existing public procurement budgets to improve the bottom line directly is something that is overlooked very often. He said every dollar can be saved and to improve value for money on each procurement exercise. The important thing here is for us to understand that the economy and the recession continue to be a public decision maker and something primarily in discussion. Uh, when you look at your statement, Rishi, talking about saving uh, from the bottom line every dollar you can, we are talking about the necessity of procurement legislation and a conference like yours to open the minds of people to understand this whole issue of procurement. Disclosure today in conjunction with the Caribbean Procurement Institute and the Procurement Innovation and Leadership Lab hosting this Procurement Week 2017. Tell me about this. What is the Procurement Learning Lab? Which is curious. It is not just a procurement conference is a learning lab exactly it's a learning lab it's it, it's it's the procurement innovation and learning lab uh in in the uk and partnering together with the caribbean procurement institute which is no stranger to anyone in Trinidad. they've had numerous conferences over the last 10 years on procurement and disclosure today we've come together to bring about this learning this procurement innovation lab and why it's called a lab as opposed to a training and a conference is because it's going to take over a period of three days that's why we're calling it Procurement Week 2017. Mm -hmm. So it's called it to happen on um, the week of the 17th of July to the 21st of July. So we're going to have it on, on Monday, the 17th of July, Wednesday, the 19th of July, and Friday, the 21st of July. And we're going to have it at the Hilton Hotel and Conference Center. And the main purpose behind this type of lab is dealing with the whole idea of public procurement, which is, is, a, is a hot topic mm -hmm. every time in trend we're going to talk about it. And recently, of course, government has, well, the former government passed the new procurement legislation, and the current government made some amendments to it, and they're now going forward to setting up the regulator and the office. But what exactly does, I mean, so we hear all these words, but the question is, what does this mean for public bodies? Mm -hmm. What does this mean for the private sector? What does it mean for the normal man on the street in terms of, procurement and what does it operate so what we're going to do in this lab and why it's called a lab is because anyone who's coming to the lab are going to have to walk with information from the organization in terms of the procurement policy the procurement practices exactly what they go about so that when you come to this lab you're going to get tools specific that's going to address your needs in your organization that you can tailor make the organization so it's going to be probably a half day of talking and then a half day of, of practical learning and doing stuff together with what information you brought to us. So that at the end of the day, when you go back to your organization, whether the, the, the act is proclaimed or not, you can now start moving forward to implementing these initiatives in your organization. There are many components um, attached to this. I will ask you to delineate a couple of them for me, but just for the uninitiated, we have had you here a number of times. So to us, we know Rishi Maharaj and Disclosure today, mm -hmm. but some of our folks who may have joined us late or for the first time having the opportunity to hear you would be good for us to give them a quick run through who is Rishi Maharaj and what is Disclosure Today? You have been in governance for a long time. Right, yeah, well, I've, I've worked in the public sector for the last 12 years in various capacities leading up to my last position, which was Director of Policy and Planning at the Ministry of Justice. But I was also in uh, one of my major functions, I guess, over those 12 years was actually being involved in the Freedom of Information Act and actually being one of the senior officers in charge of the Freedom of Information Unit uh, for, for about four or five years. So working with the Act and trying to advise public bodies and training public bodies, and also advising members of the public exactly what they need to do in order to access information from the government. A natural extension is where you are now okay. because um, your organization, Disclosure Today, depend heavily on the Freedom of Information Act to bring forward to the citizenry many things that are here or many things that some people would like to keep right, here. Right, exactly. So, so I more or less, it was, a, it was a natural segue when, when Disclosure Today came about. And I saw the, the, the hmm. need for it and the needs for somebody with my understanding of how it works in government mm -hmm. to come out and work with Disclosure Today and what Disclosure Today does. We, we do a number of things. I think one major thing we do is we have a platform which anybody can access online, www.disclosure.today, in which we can work with you to make access to information requests to public bodies online. But we also are advocacy organization. Mm -hmm. So we work with you 
withdrawal. So if you want, if you say, for example, if you want to make a request on your own, you can go ahead and make it. We can advise you on that. If you want to make a request, but you don't want to use your name, but you want some to use a, you know, more or less be anonymous disclosure. They will assist you in making that request on your behalf. So they don't see we're in a bishop name. They see my name or whoever names associated with disclosure. They only request. So it protects you and your reputation from going forward. Because a lot of people have this fear. Of if I ask for information from government, they're going to think I'm a troublemaker or what I want this for, and then I'm going to get blacklisted and it may affect yes. me on. So we try to be that buffer between the citizens and the public sector in terms of giving you that protection, but still trying to get the information for you. Freddie Douglas, I think it was, that said uh, leadership or power uh, gives nothing. Uh, you have to pull it out. The Freedom of Information Act is such an important um, piece of legislation, and that's why your organization is a good one to use to get through it. It saves citizens. For instance, if someone had something like this in the judiciary right now, which is a report on the acting, um, on the acting commissioner of police's wife, who right. was appointed as a judge, as a judge yeah. and, and the report is is kept there are laws that are cited to keep it kept but it, in case there's any way to get around that is the freedom of information act is what you have to use to get to extract that information correct exactly you can make a request on the freedom of information mm. act obviously the act allows for public bodies to exempt information mm -hmm. i mean all legislation I'm sure the world always have that exemption clause for good reasons obviously mm. but although they have the exemption clause we also have a nice clause in our legislation that talks about public interest mm. that overrides a any clause that may exist, but also overrides B any legislation that may say, well, you can't give all this information. So that's what's what, what I, what's unique about our act is that section deals with public interest because it says, uh, notwithstanding any written law. So it's not only the exemptions in the act that could be the public interest that's can override. But if you have a legislation, let's say if a good example I always use is the Statistical Act. Mm -hmm. And the Statistical Act, uh, statistical officers are bounded by confidentiality not to give us certain kinds of information. Mm -hmm. But the way our act is written, the public interest part of it, is that notwithstanding that act and what it says, if there are public interest considerations that far outweigh the confidentiality clauses in those in that in statistical act legislation, you can override it and give all the information. Compelling so public it, interest is going to override to. Uh, what many may describe as secrecy. All right, let's go back to the convention, uh, or rather, this um, this procurement learning lab. What yeah. we really what it is. Uh, you are teaching. What are you teaching? As the let's break the components down now. The sustainable procurement lab. Right. Speak so to that. Right. So sustainable procurement lab is going to be on Monday, the seventeenth of July. Uh, and that's uh, that's unique because our legislation actually when you go through the new legislation that's in place it talks about sustainable procurement mm -hmm. so now we go um, but a lot of people say okay what's well, sustainable procurement what does that mean how does that affect me how does that differ from normal procurement that i would do and uh, sustainable procurement is, is a lot of what the world is going through today it's no longer about court cost benefit analysis in terms of looking at your bottom line but organizations are now looking at the environmental impact the social impact mm -hmm. and economic impact of where you buy for i mean a good example would be uh i think right now uh, uh, is in the coffee trade for example internationally you see a lot of coffee brands now having non-conflict based coffee meaning they're not buying the coffee from places that use child labor mm. or, con or organization that use child labor or slavery or, or use this money to generate conflict in organizations so it, it's non-conflict coffee give you that sustainable that sustainable impact knowing mm -hmm. that you're buying from an organization that does not exploit other people to get the product to you another good example is china a lot of places you see in china where you have a lot of these um, big big brands nike adidas uh, all these versaces and stuff like that, that use china as a way to cheap develop labor, their yes. cheap mm -hmm. labor but mm -hmm. also a lot of these organizations all these companies in china mm -hmm. they're using slave labor or yes. you know how people work under very harsh social conditions. So, social, so the social procurement lab is going to teach you about understanding what social procurement means. It's also part of the whole sustainable development goals as established by the UN, which is after I think it's 12.1 or something like that of the UN new sustainable goals for 2030. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at the whole idea of sustainable development, sustainable goals, and how you actually use that and put that into practice in your procurement regime. So it's, it's not only going to impact public sector organization, but also going to impact private sector organization, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. sometimes you may have to, you may want to be, get get a bid from government or win a contract from government, but as part of that contract, you may also have to procure goods and services externally that, we're going to, that you're now going to use to supply the goods and services to government. So it's also going to impact you in that way, understanding what sustainable government. So you mm -hmm. have to track the money all the way down to the end. Diamonds are going to be something of particular interest <laughs> in some parts of the world, talking about slave labor and, and stuff like that. Uh, what will the Procurement Impact Measurement Lab focus on exactly what is right, that? So the procurement measurement innovation, that, that lab is going to focus on the whole idea of value for money. 
because again all the legislation talks about the whole idea and defines value for money mm -hmm. but what do we actually mean by value for money so for example we would construct we, we spend billions of dollars every year to fix roads to construct new highways we spend billions of dollars every year to construct new hospitals or to buy and procure new beds and stuff like that hospitals and stuff like that as an example but in, in, in the monitoring and evaluation jargon, which I'm, I'm familiar with and I'm trained with, we always ask the question, so what? So you've spent $5 billion to, to build a new highway. So you've spent $2 billion to buy new equipment and stuff like that in hospitals. How does it impact traffic? Do, do mm. people still have to spend eight hours in traffic to come into Port of Spain to work? Do people still have to wait two and three days to get a bed in hospital? So what have you spent this money to procure? These are outputs. Or what's now the outcome and the impact of that? So what's the, the return on the investment? Exactly. Is what so you're the whole asking, idea of yes. impact mm -hmm. measurement is going to now teach organizations what you need to do to put in place. You mean, you mean I mean, we teach us in Germany, you need to have baseline data. What is the, cons the existing state of play? Mm -hmm. okay, you need to measure against something to know if you're successful or not. What are your, are you developing proper indicators to be able to measure mm -hmm. exactly? Are you collecting data? to be able to measure. So when Auditor General or somebody asks a question, well, you spend $5 billion to do X, Y, and Z, what does that mean? How do you how do you account for that? You can now come up and say, well, we have the measurements, we have the metrics to be able to put in place to say, well, good. This is how it was before, and this is where we're now moving towards, and these are things that are happening. So you can actually now show evidence, evidence-based, mm -hmm. as to exactly why you're spending money and justify why you spend so much of money. The CEO of Disclosure today uh, is Rishi Maharaj. He is my guest this morning in the area of protecting the general citizenry, uh, and that's his organization, Disclosure Now, uh, checks and uh, and balances and in protecting the citizenry from having the point five percent or as boasted the one percent controlling everything in the country mm -hmm. i guess it comes to the area of campaign finance it comes to the question of uh, how things are given out who are supporters and who benefit from what it brings us to the area of procurement governance and transparency that lab is of particular interest these days <laughs> yeah that's my that's my baby level i'm probably going to be focusing a lot of also my time and effort so the whole focus of the procurement governance transparency is exactly that there must be transparency in everything that, that you focus on because mm. in the end of the day these organizations are spending public monies monies mm. that are generated from taxes either from taxes that people pay or taxes that we get from the oil industries and stuff like that mm. that, that we use to generate to, to buy goods and services to make the country better do you have proper transparency things in place to be able to, to manage these things? Is your system, how do you deal with it from a pre-contract point of view, post-contract point of view? How do you manage with, with your bidders who may bid for contract? Because a lot of problems happen right now is that a lot of contractors who bid for projects they don't get the projects. They, 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 they will claim, well, there was some corruption or some collusion. Mm -hmm. So is your process proper properly in place? Do you have the proper things in place to ensure there's transparency in the process? How do you now balance the procurement legislation with the Freedom of Information Act? Because a lot of things, I mean, it's, it's, it's as huge in other parts of the world where a lot of contractors use the Freedom of Information Act to go at your procurement process to see whether or not you were open and transparent. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that if you get a Freedom of Information request that deals with the procurement process? How do you balance what the Act says? The FOI Act what the new procurement legislation puts in place and the whole idea of having proper governance systems in place from the board's point of view, from the CEO's point of view, the aligned minister's point of view, understanding the state monitoring manual that exists under the Ministry of Finance. It's about balancing all these things in mm -hmm. place to ensure that in the end of the day, you can properly say, well, whatever, people make ac accusations, which is what happens normally. But you can now say, well, this is my process. This is exactly what went through. And we can now show evidence that we were transparent in everything that went on. Nothing stops anybody from, from bidding. If you are if you are a finance for organization, that shouldn't, for a po political party, that mm -hmm. shouldn't stop you from getting a contract. Obviously not. Mm -hmm. We're a small country. But once you can show that our systems were placed, we had proper transparency in terms of the procurement process, in terms of who bidded, who went through, who got the contract, then, then, then you should be able to cover yourself properly. Shell corporations have been, and bid rigging is nothing new, and that is what we are talking about yeah. in this area here. And the juxtaposition I made earlier when I spoke about campaign contribution, because that is often, unfortunately, a determinant in who gets what. Yeah, and, and, and looking this way is going to help us to understand where the money um, has gone during the election cycle and what kind of return on investment people exactly. may be getting. And that's, and that's why disclosure is, is, is advocating 
a lot for the mm. whole idea of PwC, not Price Waters and Coopers, mm-hmm. but proper procurement legislation. One proper whistleblowing legislation to put mm. in place to protect people who may want to whistleblow exactly what's going on, and proper campaign finance legislation to put in place. Because mm-hmm. I mean, just the other actors lying on my bed, just thinking about this, for example, I was like, you know, we need to look at it not um, how we focus things in Trinidad and Tobago. Unfortunately, mm. it's very very systemic and very we focus on a, one particular problem we don't look at the system mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. need to look at the system so that's why you need to have proper things in place from a campaign finance point of view so that you can govern exactly what political parties do when they're campaigning to get your vote mm-hmm. to ensure how the money is going in so that's the input side of it and then in inside of it now you have to manage the procurement part of it what goes on how they spend your money because government spends billions and billions of dollars every year to, pr- to provide goods and services and that involves procurement mm-hmm. so that's the inside of it and then you look at the output side of it if things happen and people realize that well, okay well something some collusion happening here some corruption or some nefarious activities happening how can we now protect those people who may want to whistleblow and say, listen, X, Y, and Z is happening. I want to alert the proper authorities so that investigations could be put in place. So you need to look at it systemically and not isolation. I am so happy that your organization is here because one of the reasons when I returned to Trinidad, I started looking around for organizations like yourself because I said absent this. This seem to have been absent in the past, and mm-hmm. that's unfortunate because a lot of the questions that are raised today would have been tracked at the time they were happening yeah. had you been uh, in place at that time. Let's talk about venue and registration and the cost of this uh, 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 of this involvement all right so the cost is uh, well first of all let's go to the venue the venue initially was advertised as the Marriott hotel mm-hmm. but that has now, right well that has now changed now we've gone to the hilton hotel mm-hmm. and the cost for the the, the um to attend it's 400 4207 it'd be nice if it was 400 a lot of people would probably come <laughs> <laughs> but like, obviously we still need to manage certain things mm-hmm. 4200 so, exactly mm-hmm. so the price for one lab would be four thousand two hundred and seventy dollars uh, the price for two labs would be seven thousand five hundred TT dollars, and all these are VAT exclusive. Mm-hmm. And the value for three labs would be nine thousand seven hundred ninety nine dollars mm-hmm. VAT exclusive. But if you want to be, and this is where we have no group rates. So if you want to have more than one person come from your organization, especially if you have a CEO who's coming from your organization, we have special group rates that apply. Mm-hmm. So for group rates, if you have more than for one lab, for groups of more than three, you're paying three th- you're paying four thousand TT dollars. For group, for if you want to do two labs for groups of more than three, you're paying seven thousand TT dollars, and for three labs for groups of more than three, you're paying nine thousand five hundred TT dollars. A lot for folks to digest here. If you had a website where they can go to, tell them where they can go to and look this up. In addition to right. give us the good old telephone number <laughs> after. <laughs> Obviously, so you can check our website. You can check the Caribbean Procurement Institute website. Caribbean Procurement, Procurement Institute. Institute. Mm-hmm. Right, that's www.caribbeanprocurementinstitute.com. Mm-hmm. And you can also telephone us. Telephone numbers are six, let's get it here, six two three four one zero four or four nine nine six nine five three. And you can also email us at info I N F O at Caribbean Procurement Institute, that's one word, dot com. It's a very important thing that we have going on here, so just remind folks of the dates for me, please. Right, so the dates are going to be the 17th of July, Monday the 17th of July, mm. Wednesday the 19th of July, and Friday 21st of July. So you have just about two weeks again, or thereabouts, to be able to register for this course. A very useful uh, course that you've got coming up here. Um, the disclosure today is the organization. My guest is CEO, Rishi Maharaj. I want to go into the NRGI, which is the Natural Resource Governance Institute. They unveiled the 2017 Resource Conference Index, which assesses the governance of oil, gas, and mining in 81 countries in policy areas, including state-owned enterprise taxation licensing, local impact, sovereign wealth, funds and sub national revenue sharing tnt scored 14 out of the 89 assessments ranking fourth in latin america and the caribbean behind chile brazil and colombia tnt happily performed uh, well not happily performed poorly according to the index because of national budgeting fiscal rules and open data restrictions Let's get that again. We scored poorly because of national budgeting, fiscal rules, and open data restrictions. How can TNT improve on these in the short and longer term, Rishi? Yeah, and this goes to the whole idea of we're, we're still being governed, our oil and gas industry, by, by old legislative mechanisms that, that need to be amended, need to be changed. And even our budgetary style of line item budgeting 
which we've mm. adopted from, from the old 1950s. We need, we need to, to adjust. I mean, the world has adjusted in terms of the accountancy standards that we, that we put in place to be able to account for, for our natural resources and stuff like that, the international standards now, ISO standards that exist. Mm-hmm. I think we now need to, to, to step up our game and move forward with regards to the systems and the processes that we have. That's the one problem I think we have in, in governance in our country is that we're still used to the old ways of, of doing things. I mean, I, I give you an example of, of our, account, our accounting system in government, which I, I, I'm fairly familiar with, having worked a lot very closely with, with accounting officers over the years, mm-hmm. that we still use a big book. <laughs> I don't know how, it's a very huge book that you use, for example, to, to, to budget and mm-hmm. to be able to, to track mm-hmm. budget for your, for your particular line items mm-hmm. and stuff like that, how much you have mm-hmm. commitments for and stuff like that. When you have to go for your gratuity calculations or pension calculations, the big book that they use. So, I mean, a lot of these things are still very in, in the old days of using books. And nothing's wrong with using books as, as a last means of being have, having proper checks mm-hmm. and balances. Mm-hmm. But you also need to be up more updated with regards to the whole idea of ACC and accounting, auditing, and these new procedures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, we need to, to move forward with that. And then you talk about the whole idea of open data which is something that we are very poor of also in the country in regards to giving out and having open data out there to, to allow for innovation. A lot of countries all over the world have, especially from our, our engineering uh, and these type of natural gas and oil and t- type of industries, mm. a, lot of organi- a lot of countries all over the world have, for example, all their, their maps online, all their GIS surveys online, and all these kind of different metrics and data online that these companies can now tap into to be able to come up with new ideas, new technologies, new innovative ways to be able to map out and look for certain things. But we are still very much in the old ways of doing things in the country. So we're still very much of you having to justify to me as government why you want this information and why I should give you this information mm-hmm. as opposed to the other way when government say, okay, these are information mm-hmm. that are useful that can be put out there in the public domain to allow for private sector or even private and public sector to collaborate mm-hmm. and come up with new innovative ways of doing things. So although we are, we have subscribed to the open mm-hmm. open society, open government protocol that exists in the world. I think we're one of 18 countries in Latin America. Mm-hmm. And a part of that protocol of open data and the open society uh, framework uh, we still don't do it. Yeah, we, we we have the intent to get off the dinosaur, but we have not isolated the dinosaur and no, left him yet. No, uh, exactly. A simple thing like linking, linking cells in Excel will help you would have the problem with that big book you spoke yes, about. Yes, exactly. And of course, there are specialty programs to do that additionally. According to the index uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, there was a 10-point difference between the law and how it is actually practice and governs uh, the energy sector. How do we go about ensuring that legislation is enforced to deal with this? And that's we have to have a proper enforcement mm. agency with regards to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries and the way they go about these things. Unfortunately, how it, ha- how it has been for many, many years, especially in, in that we allow or we have allowed these international organizations to dictate the terms and dictate the ways that the, that the energy energy sector is is formulated in terms of how the contracts are negotiated in terms of how what are we are allowed to do and stuff like that and it also it's also part of the politics unfortunately that exists is that if I'm, I'm sure there are many good um, I, I know a lot of people who worked in the Ministry of Energy over the years and continue to work in the Ministry of Energy over the years and I'm sure a lot of these people know exactly what's going on and exactly what they need to do to, to tap on and to make sure and enforce the proper regulations that are in place but unfortunately sometimes when you try to do it and you try to, to, to really hit the, hit the ball on the horn mm-hmm. then you get that, that knuckle on the hand saying okay wait let's take this to the minister and then there's that political side that then comes in and deals with it and, and they, they sort of sweep it under the carpet so we need to, I think, to depoliticize at times, mm-hmm. not only mm-hmm. the energy sector, but also certain ways, other sectors in the country, in the ways we, we use and, and try to enforce the laws that exist in the land, even if they're outdated or not, at least try to enforce them properly. But once that political side comes into it, then that always mm-hmm. creates ambiguity in the process. I quickly want to jump into the area of uh, state enterprising reporting rules and rules governing the Heritage and Civilization Fund. It, it appears to be sound. Uh, Petro Chen was accessed 74. Uh, I, it was accessed against 74 other state agency enterprises globally, and Petro Chen actually ranked nine out of these, uh, uh, ninth out of these state-run enterprises with a score of 75. The company was deemed to have good rules related to the report 
reporting of finances and operations, as well as transfer from the company to the central government. That's something being done right, it is, one is happy to, to, to report. Well, no, I mean, Patrick has been there for, for, for many, many years. I think the, the problem with Patrick has always been the way you manage the organization and the way you utilize the funds that you get from the organization and in terms of also reinvesting because a lot of problems with Petrochin I think has been and we've seen it now and we're hearing talks that they're over bloated mm -hmm. in terms of HR that's one I mean a lot of, a lot of polit politicians and political parties and governments have used Petrochin as a way to cash cow their political supporters into the organization let's not let, let's be honest about it mm -hmm. and then also they've never really fully had um, implemented proper facilities management in terms of investing in planting equipment, in terms of upgrading planting equipment and stuff like that over the years. It's never been that important. So it's always been about using petrogen for what the value that petrogen has, which is the, the oil money and the gas money, and using the money from that to be able to funnel mm. to elsewhere. And again, that leads to procurement. Yes. It's about using that to be able to funnel to government, for government to be able to procure and do different things, and also the whole idea of campaign financing. You, you realize that all these things are in somehow, some way interconnected. So they I mean, are all linked. I'm sure, the, yes. I'm sure petrogen has proper rules mm. and regulation in place. Mm. I have no mm. doubt about that. Mm. And they probably use that properly. But then what comes out after the whole question of so what? Mm. What's the impact? We've generated billions mm. and billions and billions over the last 50, 60 years on petrogen. But what has the value been to petrogen as a company, as an organization? What has the value been to the country as a whole? <sighs> Give me back uh, 10 years and I can get this closure today to be functioning as effectively as you're proposing to right <laughs> now. A lot of things would have been explained to me, but alas, alas, I have to live with what I have. Rishi, Rishi Maharaj of Disclosure Today, very quickly, uh, let's run back to our listeners the opportunity that organizations have to learn more about what we're talking about, which is sustainable procurement. We're talking about procurement impact measurements, procurement governance and transparency. Uh, that's the way they get the opportunity to learn of these things. Give me the venue one more time and the uh, and the telephone number, please. Right, so it's going to happen on the mm. Monday the 17th of July, 19th, Wednesday the 19th of July, and Friday 21st of July. It's going to happen at the Hilton Hotel and Conference Centers, and you can contact us at 623-4104-499-6953, and you can email us at info at Caribbean Procurement Institute, that's one word, dot com, or check out our website at www.caribbeanprocurementinstitute.com. Even check out our Facebook page online, Caribbean Procurement Institute. My brother, it's always good to see you. No problem. Thanks I for wish you me. and the family a wonderful Sunday. Thank you so much for no the information problem. and sure. good luck with the with the conference. Thank you. I'm going to see if I can find some cheap way to get it myself. <laughs> uh, Rishi, thank you so much now. <laughs>